Hey everybody, Brad Linder back with you on this Saturday evening. I'm going to be doing Darth Maul. Uh, as you can see, this one's really faint. What I'm going to be doing here is going off and uh, working from this large 11 by 17 print. And we're going to be showing some of the uh, skill set of my inking practice. So, I mean, this is called, you know, Brad Linder creating comics. And I thought it'd be a nice change. Here's the original finished eight and a half by 11 pencil sketch hope you guys can see that and uh we've got the 11 by 17 print here uh what i did eight and a half by 11 17 uh 11 by 17 print and <clears throat> i turned it blue line so that we could print it uh off and uh do the inks so the comic book process starts out from the layout that you guys saw to this finished pencil and then it goes into the inks, okay? Um, I like to blue line these so that I can save the original pencils and not get damage on them. And if something happens, then I can go off and uh, redo them and not have to worry about that. So we're going to get right into this. And I wanted to make sure this is with the page real quick. Cool deal. Hey, Jim. So... Now I'm going to pop out my pin here, and I'm just going to go at this. Uh, this is just a, uh, for sake of the practice of not using, uh, not wasting heavy expensive supplies, I'm going in with a, a, a Pilot Precise V5 uh, RT, which is refillable. And um, they have awesome stuff here with these. You can just go buy the gel, the gel ink refills, and they are phenomenal. Uh, they come two in a pack, so the pins. And uh, I keep them, you know, one ready and raring, and then a, a spare here fully loaded with the, with a little uh, wax knob on top of it that you just flick off, and uh, it's ready to go. So I keep one on the side just in case we need it. But anyway, uh, as for today, I'm going to start inking on this thing for the session and going over the process and kind of getting more of a finished piece here. And then I'm going to print this out as a black print and uh, color it up. So that'll be coming at you for the next session because I'm going to finish inking this no matter what tonight so that we can have it for tomorrow for coloring up and uh, getting him all ready to go. Now, if I put this out there, and I, I may, um, if I do for the show in the sketchbook session or in um, – one of the one of the uh, uh, rewards or whatever, you know, for a Kickstarter or just put it out there to sell it. If I do, you guys, whoever buys it, will get the entire thing. I will be giving you the original pencil piece signed, uh, the original ink sheet signed, and the original color print, one of a kind. It'll be one off. It will not be reproduced and sold except for in the sketchbook if I put it in there if not uh, maybe in an art collection later but um, right now that's where it's at so this will be a one-off piece and uh, once it's gone it's gone but you will get all of it I'm taking care of it so that you can uh, have all of those elements and we're gonna go from there but this thing is going to come off really clean, really fun, and I love doing this because this is how I do my comics, okay? This is the grade that I do comics at. I come in fully detailed, um, go at it 100%, and just knock it out. Then I print the blacks and uh, save the inks. I print the blacks, and then I color right over that, so... <clears throat> That way I don't have that blue line residue underneath because uh, a lot of a lot of it will show through. And uh, normally I would have cleaned up. If you, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but there's a blue line going across up here where the edge of the paper was because it was eight and a half uh, by 11. I normally clean all of that up in Photoshop before I print it off. But uh, in this case, I'll be inking it and then cleaning it up and going the hard way about it. And that way you guys can see that that line will be gone. And I'm going to leave it on this one so that it'll be kind of like a verification proof stamp for uh, 
this piece that you'll be able to see this is an original. You won't have to worry about that. So now what I'm doing right now is I'm hardlining the uh, I'm outlining the hard blacks, which are the big chunks, and uh, doing the fine line work around this hand and gauntlet. And this is just happens to be where I started. So cool deal. Yay us. And uh, <laughs> moving on to get this knocked out as soon as possible. So active expediency here. I'm just kind of rolling right through this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back in with a Sharpie <clears throat> and black out the big blacks and uh, knock a bunch of that out real quick for us since this is uh, a hard line copy. And you guys will get uh, access to that as we go along. And then I'll do the refinements as we go along as well. So with the And by that, I mean these smaller pieces that can't be colored in by, by a Sharpie because they'll mess it up because they're too blunt. I like to go in and fill in these lines. And that is a detailed line right there on the glove. I didn't go over, you know, or anything freaky like that. So don't think I missed. But, um, of course, you guys know me long I've known me long enough and long enough to know that when I do cross the line, I'll tell you flat out, oops, I missed, you know, that kind of thing, and move on. But in this particular case, I'm trying to leave these as open as I can so that I can go back in and knock them out and uh, cover up the fine lines. But this is the way that professionals do it. In 99% of the cases, there are some old guys that um, – are a little more traditional and they like to go over this stuff with the original pencils and they only ink the pencils and uh, that way they they guarantee that they have their stamp on the artwork which is fine you know but with the digital age coming along you know um, I've been doing this for about the last I don't know 15 years or so like this since good quality scanners and stuff came along it's been a lot easier to go in and just knock it out this way and uh, that way the original pencils if you jack it up the original pencils aren't screwed up and uh, that's a technical term by the way but uh, <laughs> I, I like to uh, push that you know and that way the artist can go off and sell the original pencils and not have a problem with it I know uh, at conventions here lately, it's been a big deal to where a lot of Marvel lawyers and DC lawyers are coming out to conventions and busting people for selling prints of original line art. Uh, some of the old dog artists are going out there and saying, okay, I'm going to make prints of the art because it's my art. I'm going to make prints of it. But they can't legally do that because you're producing that particular page for uh, reproduction with the company and that's what you're being contracted for so you can't be running around doing that you know that's illegal and uh, they are saying now that uh, a lot of the artists need to be able to benefit from that and that's because Marvel and DC don't pay uh, royalties they contractually pay you one time for the artwork and that's it and then they make millions off of it in the copies that they sell. You know, and it only takes five or ten thousand copies to make some really, really good money, you know, off of this stuff. And they sell them in anywhere from you know, the top five hundred books will sell anywhere from fifteen to twenty five thousand copies on average and go up from there. And when you start getting into 40 and 50,000 copies of these things, plus the trade books that they sell, you know, the graphic novel uh, shelf books that they sell on top of that, you start to really get in there and get some numbers going. And, you know, people are like, hey, man, you know, you're not paying us right. So if you're an artist and you're watching this, always put into your contract that you get royalties. Always keep your rights to your art and keep royalties. And if you do that, you'll end up, banking a little better than most you still won't get rich off of it unless you're just you know Mike Bagley or somebody like that that that's done 50,000 comic books in a month you know Jack Kirby style where they kick out you know 20 books a month 
because uh, he used to do one book a week, man. He used to do full on one book a week when he was working on uh, Spider Man, Amazing Spider Man, The Web of Spider Man, and Peter Parker Spider Man. Man, he was just, he owned it for about six years in there, and he just had it everything and then you know, once in a while you'd see another artist pop on where he had a filler issue or you know they make him take a vacation or whatever or he's working on a big special issue and needs more time with it whatever the scheduling situation was to call for another artist to come in and they would call another artist in you know but for the most part it was all just uh mark for a long time and then when he went to dc same thing man he was knocking out you know, Superman, uh, Flash, he was knocking out Green Lantern, I think it was. Um, it was just crazy what he was doing. He was just barking, to, you know, barking up their tree and saying, you know, bark, bark, give me work. And they said, okay. <laughs> so so that's the way it went. And, uh, you know, that now they source it out to, you know, third world countries and um, where the labor's cheaper and whatnot. And they say, you know, American artist are thriving too much on the brand of the artist, not on the brand of the book. And they're not team players anymore. And now they don't want us because of the fact that we're making money and we've decided we have to live, you know, and we've watched 30 years of artists before us starve and not have a retirement. And now going into, you know, working at, um, as door greeters at Walmart or something crazy like that, you know, um, I won't mention any names, but there are a few artists that are having some really, really hard times. Um, Rick Buckler was having really bad health issues when he passed away. And, you know, he made his money off the last 20 years off of his paintings. He wouldn't touch a comic book. He, he worked strictly on paintings and drawings that he sold. And, you know, uh, that that's just sad. That's just sad. So... When you go out there to the comic book store and you see uh, a four ninety nine comic book, you know don't turn your nose up at it because that's going to happen. Because what's going to end up going out is the industry is going to kick it out where it goes all digital, and you're going to see, you know, three ninety nine, four ninety nine on digital comic books that are coming out by independents. And the reason you're going to get that same price tag as a printed comic book, don't snicker your nose at that because guess what, we've got to pay bills, you know. And you got to consider most of these guys are doing all this stuff by their, by themselves and by hand. Respect that. Respect that. So many people. If you're a comic book fan right now and you go out and you get a $5 comic book and you're going, man, these things are just too expensive. Don't buy 80 comic books. Buy the ones you really like. Show your support and love for the artist and writer and creative team by taking care of business. You know what I mean? I mean, that's four bucks. Five bucks on a comic book that has to pay a writer, an artist, uh, most cases both are doing pencil and inking. Um, if not, it breaks it down to artist, penciler, uh, inker. You've got the letterer in there. You've got the colorist in there. You've got the editor in there. Normally, you've got an assistant editor in there. Then you've got the publishing company that's put out all the advertisement for it, and they're getting the gravy part of it. And then after that, after all that, that $4.99 price tag that's on that title, guess what happens? It gets split. And the publisher gives out, normally, thanks to Diamond Distributions, having a monopoly on it for 30 years now, they normally like to go out and cut that price for the retailer by 60 to 70% off that cover price. So... We're only getting, the publisher is only getting 40%, 40 to 50% tops on that that cover price of that $4.99. So we're already looking at $2 at a fair, generous portion of $2 and, you know, a split. So you're getting $2.50. Out of that $4.99, you're getting $2.24, you know, $2.24 and a half or $2.24, which, whichever it goes, $2.23 and a half, something like that. But anyway... Uh, it just depends on what title it is and if it's 98 cents on there or it's 99 cents on there, or if it's full $5, you know, on the marker, uh, which I see sometimes. Uh, let's just say 250 just to be reasonable. And for this example, 
what's going to end up happening is, is you're going to go off and see that five dollar price tag split to forty to sixty uh, to anywhere from forty to fifty percent for the publisher, and they still got to pay everybody else out of that. So they got to do all the advertising, all the gross overhead, all the printing, and then they got to go in and they pay all the staff on top of that five to six members, up to seven members sometimes, depending if it's split in labor. So think about that. They could be splitting two dollars and fifty cents per book, per title, per copy on that. Now, when it costs you anywhere from whatever to whatever, I mean, the low end of the stick, you're looking at 500 to 1,000 copies costing you about 50 a piece to print, low grade. Now, these bigger publishers get 5, 10, 20,000, so they get a lot less. They get under, they'll get it about a dollar 10 or anywhere from 80 cents to a dollar 10 max in most cases. And if they hit over 50,000, they get, you know, if they have a really popular book or issue coming up, they'll splurge and print more and that'll bring it down to about 50 or 60 cents a copy which um, as their overhead cost but they still got to pay for that book to be drawn they still got to produce it they still got to get everything going on where all of these people that are listed in that in that marquee on the front interior they got to be paid so you know when you see an artist or a writer or a creator you know no matter what they do Pay them the respect because they're doing it for the love of the craft. They're not doing it for money. I mean, independently, I can make money from comic books because I know how to do it and I know how to market it and leverage it and I know how to produce. And I don't worry about that as much. But these mainstream companies have made it so hard that some of these guys are living off of shows. You know, I like to call them con artists because they're at conventions. And uh, that that's something that we see all the time, and people just starve to death with this stuff going on. I'm going to talk a little less and start working on this a little more, but you get the principle here, you know. Um, so many guys are going out there and saying, you know, well, I need to live, and I need to do this, and that, and the other. They're taking up illegal activities of selling prints, and, you know, then you got these knuckleheads, these yahoos out there that come along, and I have no respect for the following, and I'm going to tell you flat out. If you're out there selling prints that you photoshopped and scaled 3D or scale out, you know, or change the color or put a brush wash over my artwork, you know, if I catch you doing it, I'm going to sue you flat out. And I'm the most upbeat, passive person in the world as far as I go with that. I try to be as lenient as possible and understanding. But <clears throat> business is business. If you screw me, I'm going to take you to the cleaners. And, I mean, that's just the way it works. I faced off against really, really interesting clients in my day. And, you know, I've had clients come up and, and have me train them and then deny the fact that they don't want to work with me on it. And then they take claim for what I taught them as a technique. I've had a few people do that, and I've had a few people go to jail for, you know, uh, the, the jail of my lockdown. You know, that's what I call it. I say, I say it's customer jail, okay? And what that means is that if they go off and I train them and I make them famous and then they screw me, I say, okay, you're in lockdown. You're on my bad list. So that's the way it goes. And I don't work with those people anymore. I don't go out and flame them or anything because that's ridiculous. But I do put, send them a, a cease and desist letter, and I'll pop that sucker in the mail as quick as possible. You know, and it's good business. I mean, it's just practical business to do that. But I see people at these comic cons doing prints, and you know, it's you know this famous artist or that famous artist, and you've seen it a thousand times over, and you know it's that artist, and. There are so many people that support these guys with these Photoshop renderings of artwork that these other guys have been paid for. And it's illegal, you know. You're stealing the company's work for one, and you're stealing the artist's original pieces for two. And I see it all the time, and they say, well, it's over 40% modified, and it's, you know, that makes it an original. Uh, no, it doesn't. If you steal it, you steal it. If it's not the original piece and it's been published in a in a, a magazine 
then that's a re illegal reproduction. I don't care who you are. And then on top of that, if you're going around reproducing other people's artwork, that's that's fraud. You're forging their artwork, just like forging their signature. So stop doing that. And if you see these guys as fans of the comic industry, if you see these guys out there and you're going to Comic Con, report them to a promoter, report them to security, have them pointed out. You know, can you show me the original of that piece? Do you own that piece or is that so and so's artwork? And have them called out, you know, have them called out because they're ripping off other artists by doing that. And that's that's a big thing for me that I'm an advocate for is protecting the original artist and then going off and protecting the original publication from the business wise as well because you know side of it as well because of the fact that business wise we have to do what we have to do in supporting the entire industry whether we like Marvel and DC or not because of the monopolies they uh, they conspire to run with working with um, you know companies of isolation where they go off into third world countries instead of hiring local or they go off and uh, you know support uh, monopolies from distributors that don't have a middleman middle ground at all and actually sabotage the markets of independent pro publishers because it's all about politics of who you know and I, I very seriously doubt I'll ever make it in the diamond because they know that I'm calling them out and it's true they run a monopoly because it's set so that independent publishers will fail. It's all about who you know. And if, you're, if your stuff is so far-fetched that no one else wants it or takes an interest in it, and they're like, ah, who cares? So the panel of your peers, i.e. people in the industry working against you as in your competition, reviewing your artwork when you submit it to them to see if there's anything upcoming and if it's of quality of professional standards, which means they're letting their their already exclusive contracting people review your work and say, well, no, I've got something like that coming down the line. I like that book. I've got something coming down the line similar. And guess who gets picked up and guess who gets to gets thrown to the side and discarded? Think about that. That says a lot. That says a lot. And that's just in their submission process. Because they say they use professionals in the industry to edit and review your work when you submit it. And they'll tell you that flat out. When you submit your book, you're going to have a, a panel of your peers review it. Well, guess what that means? If you ask them where do these peers come from, who are they? Well, they're professionals in the industry, i.e. your competition is getting to look at your book before it's publicly promoted so that they can decide if they want to say, yes, we're promoting something like it. And shoot you out of the out of the running. Think about that. That's not a monopoly. I disagree. I disagree. And Diamond will swear that they're not doing that. But the thing is, is whenever you get reviewed, they tell you flat out. It's in their guidelines. It says flat out, the book will be how, how the process works is, you have to hit this sales quota after you get the book approved. You know, you have to hit so many sales per pre-order. And they're talking like five or 10,000 pre-orders now. I mean, they just raised that up to where it's like, I think it's $7,500 <clears throat> that you have to have in net earnings, which by net earnings, that means after your overhead, okay, that there's gross earnings and there's net earnings. And that's basic finances 101, okay? I'm not an accountant or anything like that, but... I'll give you that. I mean, it's common sense. <clears throat> okay? So, with that in place, they say you have to earn $57. Let, let's say they give you a quota of 60% uh, off the top for your retail for your retail discount from your cover price. So, you, you're you making 40% on your book, period, no matter what. So, you got to pay up front to have it printed, uh, drawn, produced, printed, and then once you print the, print the book to send it to them, you have to go back in and fulfill that order within 30 days of the time that they do it. And they only fulfill it six months out. They're, the, the distribution catalog is like six months out. And 
if you get approved, you have to submit at least 90 days before that for them to go through the, the approval process. So you submit, you print your book in January. You submit your book by March once you get it back from the printer and it's all set up and paid for and, you know, you get a couple of copies in and you can get it done. And then you have to turn around and maybe get your book approved by July, maybe, from them. Now, once they approve it, that means it's gone through and whatever editors or staff or whatever they let review it, quote unquote, review it, comes in and says, okay, this is the, this is the way it works. We've decided that nobody wants to steal your concept and nobody is inspired by it. So nobody has anything coming down the line that's remotely close to it. So we'll let you do it. Well, we like it. So we'll let you get, have a shot. Now, you have to go out and make pre-orders with this thing before they'll ever submit it. They stick it in the catalog blind. You have to spend the next 90 days soliciting this thing, and it's six months out from the book release. So you got to pay for all that, all that promotion, all that branding, all that social media, all that good stuff to get word, out, word of mouth out there, and then turn around and see if the orders come in in the next 90 days when the orders go out over that last part of that six months, that 90 days and that six, the second part of that six months. So once you have all of that out there, then you have to come around and say, okay, this is the deal. I made so-and-so a quota. Did I hit my quota of net earnings? So you have to cover your, your printing cost. You have to cover your 60% of the cover discount. You have to cover your gross on the or your gross cover price on the orders that they discount which is a, a flat fee after that then you end up get which they don't disclose in the process then you end up with the last part of it where they actually find out how much money you grossed and if you grossed seventy five hundred dollars say that for example the quota is seventy five hundred bucks you make the, the seventy five hundred dollars and put back in your pocket well guess what you have you get to reorder and re-up and do the whole process again. It takes nearly a year to get one book approved through them. So can you imagine the overhead cost of doing this per month? There's no way for an independent to do it per month at that level unless they have some other form of income, which I personally do, and I don't have to worry about that. But, you know, for anybody wanting to start out a comic book, you're dead in the water, man. So we're talking nine months later when this thing actually hits the stands and makes the sales. And then you get the, you get the check around October. And you submitted the thing. You completed it and submitted it back in, you know, January. And that doesn't count the three months beforehand that you had to pay, pay for production cost to get everybody to put your book together in the first place. So you have to think about that at that scale. You know, so when you see a $5 comic book, again, I come full circle. Whenever you see a $5 comic book, don't freak out. Don't freak out because that's exactly what you're paying for. And the labor that goes into that each and every month, everybody has to get paid from that. The writer, the artist, like I said, the inker in most cases, uh, which is not the same person in a mainstream publication, but it will be the same person in an independent in most cases more often than not it will be an inker uh, the artist will be the inker as well like I'm doing now because that's why I do pencils and inks but that's the bottom line folks I mean when it comes down to that five dollar price tag think about that nobody does <clears throat> I'm checking all this out to see what's going on. So, let's see what you guys have over here because uh, then I'm going to get back to this. But, yeah, you know, uh, Thomas is saying it's forgery. Yeah, yeah, it is theft, man. It's, it's shady stuff. I mean, that's the way it works. But, uh, you know, and like Jim said, Photoshop, you know, scanning it and cheating the system. Nobody's got time for buying that stuff, but they do. And they'll buy them at $50 or $60 a pop, but yet they expect a sketch. You know, they complain about sketches from the artist 
when they go down Artist Alley, uh, you know, 30 feet away, they're buying these things because they can get them for 50 bucks, and they look cool because they're frame ready, they're prints, but yet they don't want to go down the Artist Alley, through, you know, 30 feet away and uh, buy from the artist at $100 from a live sketch. They would rather pay $50 for a Photoshop print and steal it. And people support this stuff way too easily. I mean, last year alone, uh, from about 2015 to last year alone, we've had many, many lawsuits come out and, you know, tomfoolery coming along because people want to steal artwork, you know, not from me personally, but from other artists, you know, because I, I, I put my stuff, I put my signature out on stuff. And uh, <clears throat> if I catch it, I monitor really heavy. And if I catch it, I'll bust you. And like I said, from the beginning. But like I said, when you see these guys coming out with uh, new comic books and they get more expensive, even though that they're not going to print like digital comic books, if you see them for four ninety nine a pop, I guarantee you, you'll go and buy the same novel with no pictures and no artwork <clears throat> from a writer that you like and an uh you know whatever, and you'll pay twenty you'll pay twelve twenty uh, you know twelve fifteen twenty dollars for that same book uh, as a novel, and say well that's justified. Well, how is it justified that you should pay that same kind of money? for you know what the artist is asking for or what the independent publisher is asking for for a comic book and you have a problem with it well oh, well, it's not printed so you know your cost price should go down your overhead should go down no just because it's digital doesn't mean it should be any less because that means a better benefit because that means better quality and it means better benefits to the artists and creators that are working on it so i mean you know you're undercutting Everybody asking asking them to cut the price just because they found a, a better way to produce it. And not to mention the fact that you're going to go share it with all your buddies anyway. And don't lie. You know you are. You know you are. If somebody comes along and has an interest in it and you you say, oh, man, I just, got, I just finished up the, the brand new Superman 1000. Oh, I really want to read that, but I can't afford it right now. Oh, don't worry. I bought it on digital. Check it out. And you give them access to your account and you, you give away that book. You just basically stole a sale. So, you know, and we know you do it. We know that there's, there's an estimate in comics that's called the share factor. Because there used to be a group of guys in my neighborhood when I was a kid. We would all use our allowances and they would buy up comic books and share them. And I was the one guy that would go in and buy all those comic books <clears throat> and never share them. I would put them in my collection. I, I just didn't believe in that. But I, I would never rat them out for doing it, you know, at the time because of the fact that they were sharing with what they had. And kids do stuff like that, you know. They, they were my friends. And everybody knows that, you know, it's like, hey, man, check out this magazine article. And you read the you read the magazine, and then you end up hooking somebody else into it, and then they go by the they go subscribe an issue down the line. That's the way newspapers are too. You know that's why they would allow you to share newspapers. And, you know back in the day, they would share newspapers at the work, uh, at the job front, and they would have uh, the company would buy five newspapers. And the reason they let them buy five newspapers at fifty cents at the daily uh, you know the daily count instead of the dollar twenty five price for the weekend edition, which they were for Monday morning, is because they would read them at work, pass them around, share them, and then everybody would subscribe and have them come to their house too so they could read when they're off. Think about that. I mean, it's just advertising. It's just, uh, you know, it's like when um, it's like when Amazon goes on and lets you read something on uh, Amazon Prime for free, you know. It's passing around to show uh, examples. And I'm cool with that to an extent. As long as it's regulated and as long as it's not for a limited time and it's not something, you know, that I'm going to lose a bunch of sales on. Um, but the example of that is, you know, the, Todd McFarlane of Spawn fame from Image, uh, Spawn and Spider-Man fame, that dude was carrying around uh, the last, I guess since about 2013 he started doing that. You know, as soon as the technology caught up, he was there. 2013, 2014, uh, he was selling standalone versions of his comic book as digitals. So you can either have print 
or you could have digital and you could buy them both right next to each other. You just click the button you want and it went to your house. So think about that. He made two ninety nine off of every book, uh, every spawn book, and three ninety nine are, are, are off of every digital version. And then off of every print version, he was three ninety nine. It was a dollar less for the digital version. He saved a dollar in printing. Now you think about that. Why he did that? He had multiple, multiple, multiple millions of downloads and made all of those sales. <clears throat> Okay, millions of downloads over that last couple of years at hundreds of thousands per month. He would sell 15, 16, 20,000 print books and then sell two or 300,000 digital comics. And Marvel and DC were giving them away. Okay, they were giving them away. They were like, there's no digital money in the digital market. We'll lose our, you know, hides, blah, blah, blah. Well, <clears throat> If you read it, the same stats back from March of 2017, I love or 20 uh, 2017. Yeah, it was 2017. Um, one of the funny things about that was that Marvel said, "Okay, we're not going to do that anymore," and then they pulled it and they started doing their own digital format and started producing the Marvel Universe uh, app, where you can go in and buy their digital comics direct as well as the print comics through their mail order service on their site. Now. Everybody was like, wow, Marvel's doing this, and it's cutting edge. And I was like, Image has been doing this for a few years prior to that. Um, you know, ebooks have been around forever. Come on, man. You know, don't give props where it's not due. But think about this. DC, at that same time, gave away 3.7 million downloads of their comic books where they were selling 25, 30, 45,000 in print. That sucks. That's the realization of what the digital world is coming to. And, you know, they just let those go. And Marvel was giving away digital copies free with all of their books. So what they ended up doing was is they gave it away and they said, okay, I'm moving my lamp here. They said, we're going to give out digital downloads. And, I mean, it was right there on their covers, man. They were saying, well, it's digital downloads today. You know, if you buy the book, you get a digital download copy. Well, guess what? Everybody was chipping in and buying one copy of the book and then turning right around, and everybody got access to the digital download. Think about that. They were giving away millions of dollars, millions so you think about it just by the the image model that Todd uh, McFarland had on you know the spawn page for image. Just think about that alone. So let's talk three million dollars times three. I'm sorry, but you know, three million times three three million times three dollars would be nine million bucks. Basic math that they were throwing down bawoosh for every title every title and they publish 150 titles easy so you do the math and think about that so that's a hundred times that's about nine billion bucks so 125 titles and of course I'm just throwing numbers out there I don't know the exact number and I'm not going to claim to but you know that's just crazy man that's just crazy So think about that. So whenever somebody says, oh, I don't want to publish digitally because digital sucks, uh, you're throwing money away. That's bad business. And I'm telling you as a businessman, that's bad business. And when everybody says ebooks are dying and, you know, all this mess in the, in, in the marketing world, it cracks me up to no end because I'm just like, bring it. Because when I'm still cashing in on them, you'll be broke because you didn't do it. Everybody thinks print on demand is the next way to go, so you can buy these small print machines, you know, five or six or seven thousand dollars a piece, and they think they can get three or four buddies along and print books and stuff. But paper cost is going up through the roof. Um, you know, I buy paper stock because of the fact that it, I don't think paper will ever go away. But I tell you what, electronic publication is so much more affordable and practical 
you know, uh, it's going to be tough, man. I mean, unless you're printing trades or something, which that's the practical route that I'm going with. I'm building my comics up digitally, and then I'm going into trades uh, as an aftermarket instead of print comics. Man, I tell you what, those print-on-demand comics that I'm printing in short waves are going to be just stellar in price because there's only going to be so many of them out there. And then after that runs over, the next month I go off and change the cover to an alter alternative or ulterior cover, and you can't get it anymore. Think about that one. Simple business 101. And nobody does it. Nobody does it. And I hope you all go out and do it now. Because you're not going to compete against me because my books are going to do whatever I want my books to do. Same thing with uh, any of it, you know. You're your own competition. You're not with anybody else in competition. You're with your own competition. And I like doing that because of the fact that whenever I bring that to the table, that's exactly what you're going to get, you know. Do special print on it. If you don't want to eat up those covers, do special print on demands for your convention work. You know, when you got copies of the books that you got to have for the table, make a special uh, print on demand convention cover, and they can only get it. Put the convention lo the uh, convention logo on there, and say, hey, you know, you can only do this for twenty, you know, twenty eighteen, and um, this is Comic Con so and so at twenty eighteen, and this is all you can get this edition for. And there's only so many of them that I made, and if you're not going to get one today, you can't get them. And once they're sold out, they're gone. And then you don't use that anymore, and you truly stick to it and mean it, then you don't have to worry about that. I see people do that kind of crap all the time. All the time. But people don't think about business, you know? And that's what we need to do. As comic creators, that's part of what I'm an advocate for, okay? Uh, I, that's why I'm in business the way I am. And I want to promote your stuff. I want to get you out there and show that. And I'm not trying to solicit anybody that because that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I'm in the, the field in the trenches with you guys. And I'm there every day because of the fact that I love this industry. But it is monopolized. It is cannibalistic. And it is hardcore shunning on itself. It's very self-shaming altogether. And I see it all the time. You know, um, I, I see people come up and say, well, I'll never work with so-and-so because of the fact that they're, you know, this, that, and the other. And the funny thing about that is is that, you know, so-and-so has the contact you need to get into this store or this area or this way. I mean, I've got people that I don't like and people that I just disagree with uh, fundamentally and ethically, and I'm okay with that. I, and, I mean, if that's the case, go for it. That's, that's understandable, Okay. What I'm talking about is, is don't go off and blatantly hate on somebody because they're competition. Because I tell you what, everybody's got a slot in that store that has a good, decent book. And if you're bashing on them for that, then you're bashing on yourself, and it's it's stupid. Because And I'm going to call you out on it. It's stupid. And the reason I say it's stupid is because of the fact that if you're doing it, you're belittling the community that is the business itself, the industry as a whole. You're damaging that industry. I know plenty of professional artists that are egomaniacs and think they're God's gift to everybody. And I won't work with them because of the fact that they're like that. Because I know they don't produce at that level. And they're too vain to work with. They're too hard to work with. And you can't do that, you know. But... Then on the same token, though, there are all these great artists out there that get overlooked and don't make the, the respect level that they should be because of the level that they do produce. And, you know, I hear that all the time, and it's one of those things that has to stop. So these egotistical idiots that are running around out there saying, oh, I'm a comic artist, I'm a superstar, you know, that's stupid. You're, you're an artist, you make, you make it just like everybody else does, you know, if you're if you're bragging on yourself that much, then you've got a problem. Okay, that's a big deal. That that is a big thing. Uh, that is a huge factor in that, in regard to it. And you got to shut that up. So you know, drop that. Because I see artists that have their own forums and stuff, and they all they do is uh, I won't name anybody or anything, but you'll see you know all these great artists that are supposed to be out there and these big talents, and you'll hear nothing from the big guys 
except all smiles and the greatest calmness demeanor and all that and then you'll see these other idiots out there talking about hey man you know so and so said they hate my style well go ahead and bite me you can't draw like me da, 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 with all this just bullish stuff and it's stupid stupid you know uh, be humble in your craft be professional if you're teaching it but then shut up you know don't go around bragging about it I mean I know I draw pretty decent I know I'm not the best but I know that I can get the job done and not worry about that because of the fact that I'm there doing the job and there, there's a difference you know so and I appreciate all the compliments and stuff that I get all the time but and, and I love you guys for doing that thank you for the support I really dig it thank you for that that's why we're doing this is to get the support and the uh, you know the time to hang out but um, one of the things that I hear all the time and I'm constantly telling you know people not to do especially young artists is don't listen to the ego of the artist pay close attention to how much they produce and how much they give back okay the value they share is way more important than the ego that they pump out and you know I, I know a very famous artist like I said well which I won't say anything about him directly he will know who he is if he reads this or hears this from one of his fans but I'll tell you what he told a kid you know an eight-year-old kid came up to him and, I, and asked him for an autograph and he said sure for $35 at an airport and I, I'm sorry but <laughs> man customer service and community loyalty to your tribe is not where your head is at if you're making sure that you point out 35 bucks to somebody you know and say okay this is the way it goes and I mean if I'm doing a job that's one thing and if I know someone needs to needs to pay to invest for the return of the investment of what I'm giving them in value that's one thing but a kid walking up to me and asking me for an autograph you can guarantee that kids getting that autograph I mean that's just stupid that's killing a future artist right there the future fan and turning them away because of your ego and your wallet and if you need that $35 so bad you should be at home working and not out at that con enjoying everything drinking and eating burgers with everybody else I mean that's just the fact of the matter right there and I, I don't want to sound harsh tonight because I'm not going on a rant uh, this is just the way the business is and I'm so tired of people hiding behind it saying it's not when I know for a fact it is because I live it every day you know this is the downside of comics and it's the evil underside of the Hollywood aspect of comics and I hate it and it should not exist it should not be and it should not even be a topic but it is because of the fact unfortunately we don't do anything about it you know um, nobody complains about the fact that uh, diamond has a monopoly nobody complains about the fact that you know th this artist or that artist is a is completely obnoxious and they put them up on that pedestal themselves you know they put them up on that pedestal and they say well you know I I'm the man I draw comics you know I draw the X-Men I draw this one I draw that one well, guess what you know one of these days it's like being a rock star one of these days the music or the art style or the the act the action style or the acting style or whatever your genre is it's entertainment wears off new things come up <clears throat> and if you're not evolving you're already dying think about that that fan base is the most important thing in your life and if you think it's not you're an idiot and I'm gonna tell you flat out because if you're not uh, building up that tribe and building up that fan base you are dead in the water and you just don't know it yet and so you keep right on bragging about who you are and what you make and show off your stuff and tease people with it and don't respect the people that are respecting you in return and you don't put out enough of good value in the market man you you're gonna be walking home broke you're gonna be walking home broke and you're gonna be one of these days it's gonna hit you it may not hit you for 20 years but I guarantee you it's gonna hit you <clears throat> and that's what that's the least time I want it to hit me man 
I don't want to be, you know, in that that position where one day I'm like 75 years old, 80 years old, and then all of a sudden all the all the traction stops and all the stuff stops and everything goes away, and you know I find out that I had no fan base or no traction to support me for the rest of the the time. You know, nobody wants to hear from the old guy anymore. Uh, that's one of the things that I am setting myself up not to have happen. And I want to take care of my fan base so that they remember me until my last breath. And if you don't do that for yourself, like I said, you're in deep water, deep water, and you're treading it and you don't even know it, and you're about to drown. So take that with a grain of salt, though, because, you know, I, I don't know anything. I don't try to – I don't want to point it out, you know. I don't know anything. It's just my opinion, but <laughs> it's just my opinion. But uh, yeah, watch yourself because that that's where it'll bite you. It'll get you when you don't think it, you know you you're out there thinking your ego is going to be playing on. So, and I mean I'm saying all this tonight so that you guys can find out what comics are really about, and I'm tired of biting my tongue on it out of speculation and fear of being blacklisted because frankly I don't care. I don't need Marvel, DC, or Image, or any of that. You know, they're the community, and I love their books, and I'll constantly, uh, consistently be a fan, as long as the stuff is, you know, viable to my uh, attraction to comics. But what I'm saying is, <clears throat> we need to take a bigger note and notice of how the system is broken, and not designed for independent creators to go out there and do it. Because, I mean, I can go online right now and give you a list of 20,000 independent creators that are way better guys than I am as far as the art goes. But they'll never be a, a tenth as well known as I am because of the fact that they don't do anything with it and they don't know how. And, you know, um, they've either been talked into doing conventions and making three or four hundred dollars a weekend and saving that money and going from there and making a little bit of fame and then getting a part-time job to hold them over during the you know during the off season so they can build up more work and uh, more materials and stuff to sell and more pieces ah, i'm not for that man i'm not for that i'm not with it i think it should be done differently and we shouldn't be able to make a livelihood as artists in our creation and in our dwelling at home and say, okay, this is where I'm at or in my studio, you know, and say, this is where I'm at. I can do this without a third party job. And <clears throat> that's exactly what I do. That's exactly what I do. I live it every day. And the reason I do is because I bust my butt instead of out there mouthing about how good I am. I get out there and show everybody every day that, you know, you got this, you got to produce, you got to be an artist. And that's where it comes to a fine line of, you know, production. And that's what I'm all about anyway. And I guarantee you, anybody that knows me well enough will tell you flat out, I'm all about innovation of new concrete ways to do things, innovating strategies, creating strategies. And then I come out and it's all about being practical application for those strategies to go in and be effective and get ultimate production that gives me results and takes care of business. And that's what it's all about. And that, that's always been my core message, and that, that will continue to be because of the fact. So, I mean, you know, to see these guys come out and say all this garbage all the time of, you know, uh, oh, the comic industry, da 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 da, da, da you know, people aren't buying, people aren't this, that, and the other. They haven't been trained to buy from you. You have to train your tribe to buy from you. Otherwise, you're not going to get anything out of it. You know, if you're going to see – if you're going to the conventions and seeing the same people, the same 80 people, every time you go every year and they're buying from these specific artists, well, guess what? Those are the artists that are interacting with them the most and training them to do that. That's their fan base, not yours. So the idea is to get your fan base made out of that as well to where you can make it and live it up. And if you're not going in there already owning that, that opinion and thought of that sale being yours, and them buying your stuff and knowing how to do that, you're dead. You are dead in the water. And if you make your sales, awesome. If you don't, 
and more power to you maybe next time and I, I hate to be blunt about it but like I said I just I don't like people whining about stuff and you know saying oh I can't make it work it doesn't work for me uh, no it doesn't work for you because you don't do it <laughs> so that that's my position to take on it you know I'm all about results I'm all about results that's why I draw every day I'm an artist every day when you guys see me on here I guarantee you I'm an artist for the day I may not be the best but I'm an artist for the day and I'm the best that I can be because I'm here producing every single day and that's something that you know you can take from that and uh, go out and rock it in the world with it and own it you know I, I like the idea of that so I see people do that all the time, you know, and they say, well, uh, you know, you can do it, but I can't. Well, have you tried? Well, let, let's see 10 of your drawings. Oh, no, no, I don't have 10 drawings. Well, why don't you have 10 drawings? You say you're an artist, but you can't draw as well as I do. Well, why not? Well, I can give you the blunt answer of it right then, and it'll, it'll hurt your feelings, but I would rather be harsh with you and give you the reality of the fact and thicken your skin when you come back than me blowing smoke at you going, oh, well, stay out there and practice. No. Show me the artwork. Let's see what you got going on. Let's see what works, what doesn't work, and fix what doesn't, and get you moving to the next level. That's my thing. That's my goal in life. That's my purpose. And if it resonates with you, awesome. But, you know, I get told that I, I'm in your face, I'm intense, and there are a lot of people that tell me I hurt their feelings because of the fact that I'm so, you know, present. And I, I bully them, as it were. And I've been told, you know, I, I bully people once in a while. And the thing is, is that it's not that I bully them. And I feel horrible when people say that because I don't bully people. What I do is I'm direct and I'm blunt and I don't tell them what they want to hear. And then they get hurt about it. Their feelings get hurt. <clears throat> so if I'm brash and I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry about that, but I don't have time to waste on blowing smoke at you and telling you how good your work looks when it sucks. Don't ask me how it looks if you don't want to know the truth, because I'll tell you. And that's in marketing, that's in business, that's in comics, that's in art, that's in everything. And I expect the same from other people, you know? When I ask, hey man, what do you think about this? If they tell me something's off, I'm like, ah, that sucks. I didn't see that. And then I have to go fix it. You know, that, that's the way it is. I mean, you have to be able to, to dish it out and take it at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. You know, because if you're going around telling people, hey, man, you know, this is horrible when they ask you. Of course, I don't give my opinion freely. I, I wait for people to talk to me. And if they want it, they want it. And they ask for it, then I give it to them. But I don't go around shoving it in their faces either because of the fact that I don't want to be a bully, you know, because I'm not. But if I see I can help and you're asking me for help, don't ask me if you if you don't want it because I'll give it to you. So that that's one of the funny things about that that people just freak out about. And it's just, really? You asked me for it. Why are you crying? You asked me to tell you what the artwork was. You asked me to tell you what the fix it was. And the reason was is because my mentors told me that, you know. My mentors would tell me that. Robert Arrington used to tell me all the time, you know, the, the funny thing is, it, you know, when you lose something, well, have you looked everywhere for it? Well, no, because I haven't found it yet. Because he would always say, you know, it's always in the last place you look, and you know why. Well, why? Because you find it and you stop looking. And that's true. That's very true. And, you know, I, I've always held back on this stuff because of the fact that I was afraid of what people would think or people were getting hurt you know and I always I'm very sensitive to people's opinion and they're following and I don't want to hurt anyone's feeling on purpose but the thing is the difference is I'm doing you a, a huge favor by being as blunt as I am because of the fact that uh, because of the fact that a matter of time because I'm saving you years of working with stuff that you shouldn't have to work. If you know the problem, if I know the problem and I told you, show you how to fix it, that's the way my mentors all worked. They all worked on timetables. And it's because they were all older guys. Most of them are seriously older guys cut from different cloths. You know, um, that, that's one of the things. Um, 
my grandfather was a fireman and was military and was a farmer before he retired. And, you know, I, I love him to death. He is one of the greatest men that I've ever met and one of the greatest impact um, one of the greatest impacts that I'll ever have in my life because of the fact that he is who he is. You know, he is no BS. He is no smoke, no mirrors. He tells you exactly how it is if you ask him for your opinion. But you know what? If you ask him for it, he'll give it to you. Unless then it's just uh huh and he leaves you alone. I'm just like that. And the same thing with, you know, um, people that come along and want to say, well, you know, I got this going on and I got that going on. Oh, great. Show me. Well, I don't have that yet. Uh, okay, cool. You know, uh, show me when you got it. And I get offers all the time for people wanting to work with me and wanting to uh, be either a student of business or a student of art. And they're like, well, you know, show me the, you know, show me how to do this. Tell me how to make comic books. Show me how to make this. And I'm like, dude, you do the thing, you do the process, one, two, three, four. And then a week will roll around and they haven't done anything about it. And it's like, really? Well, uh, that's why I'm going to charge you so much money. You know, I'm going to charge you now. I gave you, I gave you the advice you wanted as a friend, but now I'm going to have to charge you to keep working with you. We can still be friends, but don't come at me with that anymore. And, you know, I, I've lost a couple of friends over that because they don't want to come at me and um, they're like, well, you gave me this freebie before. No, I gave you help as a friend. I gave you advice. But if you can't handle it and you need to have the discipline put in place of being mentored and monitored and managed, maybe you should get a day job. You know what I mean? Because you're never going to complete this if you don't. So you got one chance. You either step up and finish it or we see about helping you find a day job so you can keep everything going because you're not cut out for this. And I've actually told people that. So, but this comes from <clears throat> my personal experience because I won't say anything as to who said it. Um, they'll know. But, you know, I've had family members in the past when I wanted to be a comic artist when I was younger. Uh, the, the running joke in my family was, you know, uh, that I was going to be surviving off of bologna sandwiches and, and you know, uh, cereal and mac and cheese and stuff you know, dollar store type of food and that I would never make anything of myself. And now I had to let that go from that person because that was a regret very soon we discovered because, um, you know, if they hadn't have said that, I would have never been hurt and driven as a young man by the anger behind it and the frustration to prove them wrong. It was a challenge to me. And, uh, you know, that's part of who I am and what I'm about. And now I love that person very much, and uh, it hasn't changed our relationship at all because I didn't take it that way. I took it personal as a drive, and then when I slapped them in the face with it and slapped my first comic book down, I was like, you know, that's it. Don't say that anymore. And they haven't since. And they've apologized numerous times about it. And once in a while, when a new comic comes out, that gets, you know, the apology again. And it's just like, uh, it's over. It's an experience. It's done. But when I was a, an 11-year-old kid and I heard that, that changed my world for a while. It really did. That changed my world for a while. And that's why I work with kids and tell them all the time, you know, if, you, if you're online and you're listening to this and you see my stuff, Come to me. I'll tell you how to fix it and get it going real quick so that you can progress, not digress. There's a huge step there. So, I mean, I know I'm all over the place tonight, and I apologize for that. I, I just wanted to talk about the industry, and I wanted to vent a bunch of this stuff off because, you know, it's time for a change. And my site's coming up this weekend, and I am so tired of the industry being the big problem that it is for everybody so that's where we're at right now I want to bring that out and like I said I want to make change so I just wanted you guys to know that okay so I hope it's been entertaining I know I've been talking a lot <laughs> and I'll lighten up so we can finish this piece 
But uh, <clears throat> yeah, man, I'm not playing around. I'm not playing around. So this is part of why I do what I do. You know, I love the comic industry, but the kind of the comic industry doesn't love artists as well as it should. It doesn't love any creators as well as it should. It abuses them as horse labor, you know. And uh, no offense to horses or any, you know, Aquarian fans that are out there. I'm not saying that horses are any less important. I'm just saying that it's one of those things where the industry uses us as labor, as bulk labor. And they wouldn't exist without us. And the stores abuse the finances and they take 50 to 60 percent of our retail profit. And all they do is stock it. And if they don't like it, guess what they get to do? They get to send it back. Think about that. If the store doesn't like it and they hold it for 30 days, they can send a book back to Diamond and uh, get a refund. And then that publisher is cut the next month if they're still in play. Still in play. If they're still in play. Remember how I said about that process? If they're still in play, they get to come up and get a refund tagged to their file. And then if they get so many refunds, Diamond drops you without notice. They just send you a little letter. When you get your next stipend, off of your books, and they say, okay, well, we're not going to review next next month's book. And this is two weeks before you have to send it in for review. And remember, you're six, seven months ahead at the bare minimum for that. By the way, remember you're six or seven months ahead in your in your distribution process for that next book. So you'll still have a couple of books down the line unless they just drop you flat out, which they tend to do because they tell you, well, we're not going to drop you. We're going to be you'll be fine. And then they turn around and they drop you. So <clears throat> then you're stuck. I'm going to switch over to a Sharpie here so I can speed this along with some of these. Uh, heavy blacks and fill them in but yeah I mean think about that and you've already gotten six issues approved they're gonna drop you because they're gonna carry the line because the sales don't work anymore so you're so uh, you get your sales feedback on say issue number four you've processed every month to get issue uh, four through nine in the chain and you're working on about ready to submit issue 10 and your rep calls you up and says, well, we can't carry you anymore because book, book four didn't make it. So book five, six, seven, and eight and nine aren't going to make it. And 10 is not going to be reviewed because we can't carry you anymore. Think about that. Think about it. That's horrible because you're not only losing one month, you're losing massive amounts of work. Because you're losing back those other issues when they drop you. Think about that. That's horrible. And it shouldn't be that way. If one issue has a bad month, they shouldn't drop the rest of your book. They should keep it on and say, you know, hey, man, you got 10 refunds this month. Oh, well. So issue five, you're going to have to give us those refunds back. Okay, cool. Cover the loss. That's the way business functions. But they don't do that they completely drop you out of the catalog. So don't let them fool you into thinking that they're the only game in town because you don't need them. And you'll see very soon that you won't at all need them. They need you because you've got comic books and they've got retailers to fill comic books with and they need those orders. Don't let those retail shops think, let you think and trick you into thinking that you need them. Don't let those distributors let you think that you need that that you need them. Okay, you don't. You really don't. I say that all the time because of the fact that you don't, and it's one hundred percent true. Oh well, I need Diamond because they've got the most reach. They're international. So what? The internet's global. The internet is 100% global. Oh, well, I need Comixology because they're online. No, you don't. It's a website. Guess what? 
you post up a website, you can do the same thing. Oh, well, nobody will know my comic books are there. Well, then promote the page. Promote it. Do the work. It's called advertising. It's called marketing. So think about it. Think about it. And the funny thing is, we'll end on this one because this is funny. I've mentioned this before, is the fact that, <clears throat> you know, Marvel and DC both, they have these fan favorite contest things that they hire people through now. And it's funny to me because you have to pay to go to a convention and you have to compete with the other artist. And uh, they basically have a contest to get people involved. And they say, well, we're going to pick one guy from the, from these 30 people that we let in. And we got accepted. We're going to do all the work. And you have to be pre-accepted like months in advance for when they do these things. Because they do them for like Big Apple Con and uh, New York Comic Con and San Diego and Wizard Con and all that mess. And they do the big shows. And the funny thing is, is you have to be accepted like six months in advance for these competitions. And you have to show them where you've done comics. You have to show them your work history. You have to show them your fan base level on social media. And basically what they're doing is they're gauging if you have someone that can, if you're someone that can come in, do the job that they can, they have to throw you the bone with because of the competition guidelines. You have to be able to prove that you can do the job. And then you have to go in and give them your fan base. So they go in and say, okay, this guy's really liked. I'm going to give him six months on a book. I'm going to give him six issues on whatever title it is, you know, Spider-Man 2044 or whatever, you know, the title will be. And it will be some obscure title. And they'll go on and give you that that running. And then they turn right around and they say, okay, well, now your six months is up. Now go back home. And when you go back and your contract is over, guess what happens? All your fans that went to that book are invested in that title now, not in you. Think about that one. They're now invested in you, not that title. And when they go back to your book, they're either going to have to give up the really good quality Marvel book and go back to your offbeat title that you got them following you with, which they've totally lost interest in because you've been off of it for six months because you've been working with Marvel. So, or even longer because of the fact that you have to do the pre-production before they'll ever advertise the book. You know, so you'll be working six to nine months easy before you ever get a book completed. And then maybe it'll come out in the same year. Oh, well, it'll be out next May. Well, guess what? It's June. So <laughs> you've killed your entire market working for them exclusively during that six months. Think about that. And they do that so you can't do what Image did which those guys left and took all their fan base with them, and you have to work exclusively for Marvel for six months or exclusively for DC for six months. And the reason why is because they want to get your fan base, they want to get your following, and then they want to shoo you off because they changed direction because they're owned by Disney, which wants the outpouring of you know different levels of whatever, and they're changing their directions all the time with the current market because that's what they do. So... Think about all that mess. That's scary stuff, man. So you still want to get in comics? I asked that question. I posed that question. You still want to get in comics knowing what I just told you? I know I am. I'm in it every day. It just depends if you want to be independent or not. Or if you've got, you know, if you've got the guts and the nerve and the draw and the power to be independent versus going into it as wanting to be one of the guys that works for, you know, six or eight months for one of the big guys. I mean, granted, those books are awesome, but they're not everything. And they're so hard strung right now, you can't even get a solid story out of them. So why? I ask again, do you still want to be in comics? I know I am. But... 
like I said, it just depends on where you're at, where your base is, where your fan base is, where your tribe is, where your focus is, where your market is, where your voice is. And I wonder how many people will have, you know, the backbone to do what I just did and say all that publicly because I've said it for years. And I know I'm blacklisted by Marvel. I know I'm blacklisted by a few artists, and that's okay. I understand. But I'm still friends with re really cool people that let me have my own opinion as well and my own facts for the work because they got in from being hands-on. They got in with the old guard before they changed over to where it was completely corporate and non-hireable. And they're worried about losing their jobs, so they're not going to say anything because they're in the same position now making their job every single day, approving the next issue to next issue to next issue on the jobs and trying to stay alive and keep fed and keep, you know, art coming in. Just like we're trying to get in, they're trying to get, stay in, you know, they got to stay in and stay on and keep it going. And I see that all the time. And like I said, this is not a rant. This is just calling it like it is, being real about it, and saying flat out what nobody else will say because they're afraid of being blacklisted and blocked. And I'm not. I'm really not. I don't care. If you blacklist me, then I'm not one to resonate with you. You know, you're not the one to hear the message. And it's plain and simple. And if, you know, if I don't get a job from you because of it, it's that that's fine. That's not... I'm not the talent for the, for the position you're offering. Sorry. And I'm okay with that because I can't draw every book anyway. I really like doing what I do. But it's not going to break me if I don't. It's really not. So, and it's not a challenge to people for me not for me to say that. It's not a challenge coming out to tick anybody off or anything or block myself. What I'm saying is that it's okay. If you have a difference of opinion in mind, that's fine. But I'm ready for the change of the market to where we can do what we need to do and make good comics. I'm not about kissing anybody's butt politically or socially to make them like me. Oh, well, you, you, know, you go buy this editor five beers and they'll give you a book. Well, yeah, because they're drunk. They don't know any different. I'm not a drinker. I don't do that. I'm not a con guy. I don't do that. I go to specific things once in a while, but it's rare, man. It's rare because I don't want to get tied up building all that content up for a maybe when I could be making a paycheck or a comic book or, you know, a piece of art or a training for you guys or anything of any kind of value. Versus going there and, you know, getting shunned because of who's talking crap about me at the next table. Or who disagrees with my stuff. You know? Because we get so butthurt these days. Everybody gets butthurt about everything. And that's a technical term, mind you. You know, everybody gets butthurt about everything. And it's not, you can't say anything anymore because it's politically incorrect to say anything. And if you have a difference of opinion, oh, you're dead. But in this instance it needs to be said you know it needs to be said there's so many guys out there that think they're top notch because they're in the market and they made it and they met the right person and what they don't understand is opportunity all opportunity all opportunity 100 percent comes in who you know not what you do all opportunity is presented in who you know not what you do the opportunity to do what you do is based on the opportunity of who's willing to give you the opportunity to do what you do. But that only comes in knowing the right people to get it in front of. Think about that. So anybody that says, oh, yeah, I made it here, I made it there, I did this, I did that. Well, guess what? It may be because they made it all the grunt work themselves and did all the, you know, all the promotions or all the creations or all the pages like I do, you know, that kind of thing. What I'm saying is you got to understand, you may have done the grunt work and that's fine, but without that fandom following your message, you're dead. 
So they gave you the opportunity. So when you say, well, I made it by myself, nobody gave me a job offer or anything, they followed your message. They followed it. They gave you that opportunity. And to say it otherwise is foolish. Okay? Foolish. Now, when you get into the production side of things, are you willing to build up a base and give up your comic book and give up your livelihood and give up your title and give up your stuff for six months, nine months, 12 months for a contract just to say you worked for Marvel? I mean, there's no prestige in it anymore. It doesn't matter if you work for Marvel or DC. Everybody works for Marvel and DC because anytime you do a comic book, I'm working for Marvel and DC right now for free because I'm putting out this Darth Maul character, which Disney owns the Star Wars franchise. So therefore, if I'm doing this sketch, guess what? I'm working for them. But in turn, I put value in it because I'm working for you. If you see this and you you resonate with it and you follow my artwork, this is why I do this because I'm doing it for you. You're the one giving me the opportunity to do this every day. Not them. Not them. And I know that, and I respect that. And it's got to be that way, you know? However, then on the same token, though, you get fandoms uh, going out there, and all these fanboys in these fandoms come out and say, well, you know, you're not Rob Liefeld, you're not Todd McFarlane, you're not, uh, you know, whoever, whoever, whoever. Well, no, I'm not. Well, why can you charge this much and do this and do that? And, you know, you need to kiss my butt because the customer is always right. Well, guess what? That's not true. That's not true. And besides, you're not a customer. You're a prospect to me. If you come up to me and say, oh, man, you need to kiss my butt because, you know, you've got to convince me of this. No, I don't. You'll hear my message, and if you resonate with it, then that's awesome. If you like my stories, if you like my art, if you like my marketing, if you like my business, if you like my voice, if you like my stuff, then fine. <clears throat> Which I'm all for presence in marketing. I do it all the time. I do it every day. But I see so many people come up to me and go, well, you know, you got to prove this to me. you got to prove that to me. And no, I don't. Okay. If you disagree with it, move on. That's fine. No, I don't. I really don't. So <clears throat> don't let people scare you because you think that you owe them something. Don't disrespect anyone because you don't know them. Okay, you don't have that right. But on the same token, they don't have a right to judge you and come up and criticize or rip on you just because they think that because they're a fan of the art. They know how it's made. Just because they think they know how to make a little bit of money, they know how it's made. Just because they think they can do what you do to an extent because they're a fellow artist, that's completely BS. Okay? And I'll tell you hands down, that doesn't matter in art, that doesn't matter in marketing, it doesn't matter in anything. No one can do what you do. They may be able to do something in the same field and same genre, but no one can do what you do. And when you learn that, you are all about replacing the you factor with presenting your brand and your material and your content, okay, because that, that takes the you factor out of it because then you're the conduit, which gives the energy that flows through, which is your craft and your message and your purpose. Think about that one. So... I hear all the time, you know, oh, I can't draw stick figures. And I know Jim jokes about it and stuff, but it's not Jim I'm referring to. Um, he draw, Drawing's not his thing. He knows that. But what I'm saying is, oh, I, you know, I'll never be as good as you. Well, then you'll never be as good as me. Well, why would you say that? Because of the fact that you just said it. You really believe that? Oh, my God. Well, I believe what you believe. And the sad truth of it is if you say that you believe that, you believe that, and then therefore I can't do anything to change that. Especially if you lock it down as a belief. 
However, if somebody says, you, you know, I, I don't get it, man. Your stuff, uh, it's not my thing. Okay, I respect that. Your stuff sucks. No, no, it doesn't. You just don't get it. That I don't respect. What sucks is, is your shallow opinion of, of other people. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to think about that one. So, but it is what it is, folks. It is what it is. So, and I hate that statement to say it is what it is, but the thing is, that means for me, when I say it is what it is, that means it doesn't stick with me because it is what it is. I can't change it. That's an opinion that I don't have to deal with. So think about that one. Think about that one. And make that your new motto, you know. If somebody criticizes you, say that it is what it is, which means it's an opinion. It sucks, but it's an opinion, and I'm over it. And move on. Move on. Because I see professionals, 30-year veterans of artwork, get ticked to no end because, oh, man, that kind of looks like so-and-so. Oh, man, I don't draw like so-and-so. So-and-so came out the same time I did. I, I don't draw like so-and-so. I, I never draw like so-and-so. So-and-so's got an anime thing going on. So-and-so's got blah, blah, blah going on. So-and-so's got this going on. And I love to freak those people out because they get so bent for no reason. And they make it personal because everybody's got an ego and they get butt hurt. And I hate that. Now, do I go provoke it? No, of course not. I don't have time for that. Time is not a renewable resource. I don't care if somebody says you can get more time. They're lying. You have the 24 hours in the day that you have. You may only get five hours of that day. I'm sorry, but you could be in an auto accident and knock on wood for you the next day that it doesn't happen to anybody. But the thing is, you know, you could be out getting uh, gas in your car. And some idiot next to you smoking, you don't realize it, and he blows you both up. You know, you don't get time. You get the time that you have right in the moment. You schedule for time that you don't have, and you put in the order for it. Basically, you're going, you know, you're going to whatever you believe uh, spiritually, and you're saying, hey, man, you know, I'm going to go see the doctor next week at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, and it's Friday of this week. Well, guess what? You're putting in the order, but you don't know if you're going to get it you got to wait for upper management to decide if that's going to happen. That may be the universe for you. That may be God. You know, um, that whatever you believe, I'm not going to judge that. What I'm saying is, whatever you believe, you got to wait for upper management to put in that approval. If you make it and you complete that, uh, that 2 o'clock meeting or 2.30 meeting or whatever it was, then awesome, you got approved. But, but you might be killed right outside that door. A comet could fall from the from from the sky, you know, and break up into meteors and hit you in the head. You got to think about that. Time is a non-renewable resource, man. Non-renewable. Once you're up, you're up. You don't get any more. And that's why I've, I firmly believe that. And I'll tell you, hands down, why I believe that. Don't think that I'm being cynical. I'm being very practical in this. My baby sister died passed away of cancer a couple years back now, and it was very, very intense for me because I came to the realization, you know, I've had, uh, I've had a, bitter, a, a bitter interaction with knowing the knowledge of, of mortality anyway. But, and I'm not going to go into a preachy thing where it's an hour of that. What I'm saying is that example, her passing made me wake up and live. And I was like, before that, I was always like, well, you know, this year, I think I'm going to do a comic book. This year, I think I'm going to do this. This year, I think I'm going to do that. And, you know, one of these days, I'm going to do this. It was always a future projection, okay? And then that changed. And it became all about how fast can I draw this today to get this book out? Because if I die tomorrow, what's going to happen? You know, that book will never get made. No one will ever know that story. If I don't write my fifth novel this week, what's going to happen? You know, that kind of thing. It changed. It changed to, to not from one day I'll do, 
but it changed to how much can I do in today, not tomorrow. Big, big deal. And I still, don't get me wrong, like I said before, I still project out, and I'm, I'm a business person, so I'm always about longevity and about, you know, getting stuff done and whatnot and putting it out there for six months down the line, 20 years down the line, that kind of thing, and where my business is going to be way beyond me. But where my daily projection goes into my schedule, dude, you got to pay for my time because I'm not going to give it to you. And I'm paying for this time right now by doing this to give you this value so that hopefully you get the same message. And that's part of it, you know. I want to see you guys make it. And I want to see you guys be successful. And I want to see you guys get out there and, and produce your comic books, produce your, your uh, marketing, produce your websites, produce your videos, produce your music. Whatever it is you're a fan of, get out there and do it and make that mark and make that message and go for it. And, you know, the reason I'm doing this on this platform is because this is my, this is my primary source because I'm in comics and marketing, okay? This is where I'm at, and this is my two niche force uh, foundation. So decide what your life is about. Decide what you're going to do with it, and don't let anybody at a day job tell you ever that you're underestimated or under uh, under accountable or underqualified, Okay. Because they're not qualified to make that decision, only you are. And with all this stuff that I've been talking about, you know, value, integrity, uh, effort, all this stuff that I've been pinging on tonight is for a reason, you know. I want to share that and I want to bring it to full circle because of the fact that I had a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine today, tell me that... <clears throat> Life was um, of no longer an interest to him. And I was like, screw that. Absolutely, 100%, screw that. I've been there. I was a stupid teen. I got depressed. And, you know, I thought, well, what would the world be like without me? And... <clears throat> Now, It's a Wonderful Life and Secret of My Success are two of my favorite movies. But, you know, um, I, I tell you, I would never think of uh, taking my own life, ever, ever, ever. And I've got too much to do, you know. And I told him, I said, that, that exact message, I said, flat out, you got to get off your butt, man, and start doing stuff. The reason you're down in the dumps and you feel this way is because you're not doing anything. So, you know. And I'm not going to baby you for it flat out. You either do something about it, either get a doctor, call the hospital, get yourself evaluated, get back on your feet, get yourself some help, or you help yourself and you move forward and you step up and do what you got to do and wake up and get out of this stupor that you're in and, you know, man up, grow up, and step up. And luckily he decided to do the right thing and go from that, and I'm not bragging by him coming to a solution that way, but what I'm telling you is, is flat out, if you're in that position where you don't know what you want to do in life, and you think, oh man, this is it for me, I'm stuck, and that's because it's where you put on the brakes, so go back and think about what I said in the beginning, full circle here, and then I'll shut up for today, and I'm going to go ahead and ink the rest of this tonight offline, and we'll color it tomorrow, but I'm going to tell you flat out right now, like Robert Arrington told me all those years ago, probably 20, oh my goodness, I feel so old now. Um, <clears throat> it was 20, 25 years ago now, maybe even longer, that, you know, uh, Robert told me flat out, he said, man, the reason you find stuff in the last place you look is because that's where you stop looking. So if you don't find what you're looking for, you either stop looking and be okay with that, or you get off your butt and you keep looking. Plain and simple. It's that way, guys. Whether it's comics, whether it's marketing, whether it's whatever. So, you know, um, I want to make this about the artwork, but like I said, I, I just had to do that today. Um, I'm tired of holding back and not speaking up. And if it helps someone else in the same way that it helped my friend, I am very thankful for that and appreciative of the time. And we'll, we'll go from there.
So as it goes right now, we got about an hour and a half into this, a little bit longer than that. I'm going to spin this bad boy around and show you where I'm at right now. Excuse my sniffles coming up. <clears throat> uh, we have Darth Maul here, about halfway inked, well, about two-thirds inked. I'm going to go ahead and get in that lightsaber tonight, and I'll get the, the legs and the rest of the robes. And come back tomorrow with a much lighter topic, and we will talk about comic book coloring and things like that and see where we want to go with this. Um, also, we may see where we want to go about giving it away or um, who wants to be interested in getting it or not. I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. But <clears throat> just to review, there's the original pencil piece, which you will get if you get this one. There's the 11 by 17. See, that's how artwork translates, by the way. Um, I'm going to close it with this. You see how clean this is, right? You see how clean this is, right? You can't do this with traditional artwork. So think about that. Um, normally, we draw big from a full page 11 by 17, the 10, and 15, 10 by 15 scale, and then downsize it to the comic book format of normally 6 by 10, uh, 6 by 9, 6 by 10, right around in there. And what people don't get is I upscaled this thing from this to this. That tells you how lucky I am and blessed I am with the artwork that I do because of the fact that I'm very super fortunate in the fact that I was able to come up with such clean lines that I was able to scale this up. This is the first time I've ever tried this, and it worked without pixeling, without problems, without drama. All of it worked beautifully. Now, I'm going to leave you guys with this. We're going to finish it up. I'm going to ink this tomorrow, uh, tonight, like I said, and I'll have it for tomorrow's show uh, where we can color it. I'll make a black, a solid clean black print and uh, clean this blue line off so you'll know that it's the print. And uh, we'll color him up and get him done and move on to the next one. As always, we have this rock for a limited amount of time. As you know, the clock is ticking every single day. So make it a cooler place and uh, set it up for the next generation. Talk to you tomorrow.